Thank you so much everybody for coming tonight it's an honor to have you here we appreciate your attendance this is one of the most interesting questions that plagues contemporary society the issue of God and his relationship to our lives some people think it's a good relationship some people think it's a bad relationship and we'll hear from both of those sides tonight our debaters are dr. Michael Shermer and pastor Paul Vigiano dr. Shermer is the founding publisher of skeptic magazine a monthly columnist for Scientific American, a regular contributor to Time.com, and presidential fellow at Chapman University. His new book, The Moral Arc, How Science and Reason Lead Humanity Toward Truth, Justice, and Freedom. He's also the author of The Believing Brain, From Ghosts to Gods, to Politics and Conspiracies, How We Construct Beliefs and Reinforce Them as Truths. The Mind of the Market on Evolutionary Economics, Why Darwin Matters, Evolution and the Case Against Intelligent Design, and the Science of Good and Evil. He's been a college professor since 1979, also teaching at Occidental College, Glendale College, and Claremont Graduate University, where he taught a transdisciplinary course for PhD students on evolution, economics, and the brain. As a public intellectual, he regularly contributes to opinion editorials, book reviews, and essays to the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, Science, Nature, and other publications. Dr. Shermer received his BA in Psychology from Pepperdine University, MA in Experimental Psychology from California State University, Fullerton, and his PhD in the History of Science from Claremont Graduate University. He appears on such shows as The Colbert Report, 2020 Dateline, Charlie Rose and Larry King Live. His two TED Talks seen by millions are voted to be in the top 100 of more than 1,000 TED Talks. Also with us tonight is Pastor Paul Vigiano. Paul has been the pastor of Branch of Hope Orthodox Presbyterian Church for 27 years. Paul has a master's degree in apologetics from Biola University and has been an instructor at various colleges. He attended Talbot Seminary, King's College Seminary, Bonson Theological Seminary, Westminster Seminary, and Fuller Theological Seminary. His recent debates have been with Douglas Hamp on eschatology and opposing atheists Bruce Gleason, Sean Taylor, and Andrew Breeding of the Los Angeles Freethinkers Alliance and Backyard Skeptics. His Soli Deo Gloria radio program has been broadcast on KKLA in Los Angeles for 18 years. He's been a newspaper columnist and writer, but his primary calling is as a pastor. Paul has lived in the South Bay area of Los Angeles his entire life. He and his wife, Jennifer, have four children. So uh, we did have a coin flip at the beginning, and Pastor Paul will be going first. Good evening. Thank you all for uh, attending. Thank you, Biola, for opening the venue. Thank you for my wife for her patience. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shermer, for your attendance here this evening. I'd like to uh, begin by stating that over and above being an apologist, I'm a Christian, I'm a husband, I'm a father, and I'm a pastor. Uh, there is a looming fear when participating in events like these that we might be careful not to violate the third commandment that we might not use the name of God in vain. So looking for gotcha moments or simply seeking to win an argument, in my thinking, is to use God's name in a very empty way. And I think that should be avoided. I would hope that I would recognize that when I speak of the things of God, that I'm speaking of something much greater than myself. And that should be pursued with love and grace and humility. Now that being said, I'm here because there is a very aggressive movement on the part of the new atheists, the, the neo-atheism, to convince the world that belief in the triune God, and of course, they'll say all gods, but it does seem that they focus in on the Christian God, that belief in God 
requires a suspension of intellect. That to believe in Christ really means you have to check your brain in at the door. Well, I'm here because I want my children. I want those who attend the church where I'm the pastor. I want the students at this university and anyone else who I might have influence upon to know two things. One, that trusting in Christ does not mean you have to abandon clear thinking. As a matter of fact, this evening I'll argue it's just the opposite. Secondly, that if you walk away from your faith, you have not seized the higher intellectual ground. The notion that Augustine, Aquinas, Luther, Calvin, Knox, Owens, Edwards, Van Til, Gordon Clark, Greg Bonson, Alvin Plantinga, Plantinga, or even closer here, J.P. Moreland or William Lane Craig, are believing in a triune God over and against sound thinking should be a highly challenging thought. Now, it may be true that smart people can believe foolish things, but generally not in their chosen field. Now, the debate. We're debating whether atheism or Christianity is more reconcilable with the human experience. So in certain respects, this debate will be somewhat existential. That is to say, we are going to appeal to our experience. Now, it may come as a surprise, but I'm not gonna ask anybody in the room to believe something that they don't already know. There will be no petition to take a blind leap of faith. It will be my goal to show that if you are not trusting in Christ, and I have to say here, I'm arguing for the triune God who lives. I'm not arguing for theism in general, and I think there are good reasons for that that probably go beyond the spectrum of the debate this evening. But that is, if you're an atheist, I'm gonna argue that you will be required to be inconsistent in your approach to life. In short, atheism cannot make sense of the things that we all know to be true. So we're going to appeal to things that we know to be true, then ask if the things we know are best explained if there is a God or if there is no God. For example, if everybody walked in here this evening soaking wet and shaking off umbrellas, it would be best explained by drawing the conclusion that it's raining outside. Now, the fact is, it might not be raining outside. There might just be somebody out there squirting everybody with a hose. But I'm gonna argue this evening that our knowledge of the existence of God is more certain than looking at everybody who would be wet with umbrellas, even if they testified that it's raining outside. We know in, in a more certain sense that there is the triune God. Now, leaving aside for now that our very existence, that we are here, cannot be explained by atheistic, materialistic naturalism, since a purely naturalistic understanding of the human experience, one that does not allow for supernaturalism, cannot explain how something comes from nothing over and against Lawrence Krauss's new book, A Universe from Nothing. But an eternally self-existent triune God easily explains that. Again, leaving that for now, what I like to appeal to are things that you know, things that you are willing to admit, things that you will say that you know. Then ask if you can consistently hold to your current convictions if we are purely material, if we are merely the most recent layer of an explosion, stardust, as we've been told. Again, Lawrence Krauss said, forget Jesus, the stars died that you could be here today. Now, keep in mind the options. You were either fear, fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God, or you're the end result of an inexplicable explosion. So let's start with a test. You have come to this debate, and you are gonna decide whether my opponent or I make stronger or weaker points based upon various criteria, most predominantly the criterion of logic. So the question I have for you is, is that logic that you're holding to, that you're gonna hold us to, is it material or is it immaterial? Is it culturally determined or is it transcendent? And by that I mean that it's, it's invariant, it doesn't change, it's consistent, and it's not in here, it's above us all. To put it in simpler terms, is logic determined by the conventional thinking of society or is it determined by something that doesn't change? I'm gonna put it one more way. If I'm not making sense, am I not making sense to you? Or am I not making sense, period? 
You see, if you embrace the latter, if you hold the position that a person who is truly wrong is wrong, regardless of what's going on in the room, in the city, in the state, the nation, the world, or history, you are not being consistent in your atheism. If you embrace the latter, you are acknowledging something immaterial. You are acknowledging something transcendent. Things that can only reasonably be explained by acknowledging an immaterial and transcendent source who has revealed himself as God. After all, think of it. If logic is merely the product of evolutionary development, and since there are variants in our evolutionary development, in other words, we all evolve differently, who gets to say which side of the room has evolved better or further? Are the laws of logic produced by the evolutionary development of our prefrontal cortex? Is that where they come from? Now, I'm not appealing to your pride. I'm not appealing to your ego or your feelings. I'm asking you to examine the faculties by which you are evaluating this very event. If you are certain that you can make accurate assessments on that which is reasonable, true, and sound, and arrive at valid conclusions, things that atheists love to say they do, you are living in betrayal of your atheism. Now, you might be saying to yourself, you're just creating a problem that doesn't exist. Well, let me appeal to Charles Darwin, the father of the modern evolutionary theory, in a thing called Darwin's Doubt. And Darwin wrote this, with me the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? You see, if you're trusting in your own mind to think clearly and arrive at any certainty at all in anything, even the most simple of, of propositions, you are not justifying your atheism. You are in conflict with yourself. Atheistic, naturalistic, materialistic science cannot justify or explain its own ability to think clearly. It's difficult to say things better than C.S. Lewis, so I'm just going to quote him because he addresses this very thing. He says, If the solar system was brought about by an accidental collision, then the appearance of organic life on this planet was also an accident. And the whole evolution of man was an accident too. If so, then all our present thoughts are mere accidents, the accidental byproduct of the movement of atoms. And this holds for the thoughts of the materialist and astronomers, as well as for anyone else's. But if their thoughts, that is, of materialism and astronomy, are merely accidental byproducts, why should we believe them to be true? I see no reason for believing that one accident should be able to give me a correct account of all other accidents. It's like expecting that the accidental shape taken by the splash when you upset the milk jug should give you a correct account of how the jug was made and why it was upset. The great 20th century apologist, Dr. Greg Bonson, took it to the next level when, it was at, when he was asked, Dr. Bonson, what is your proof for the existence of God? He answered, my proof for the existence of God is that apart from acknowledging the existence of God, you can't prove anything at all. More thoroughly stated, he taught the transcendental proof for the existence of God and that's what we're talking about this evening, the transcendental argument. The transcendental proof for the existence of God is that without him, it is impossible to prove anything. The, athe the atheistic worldview is irrational and cannot provide the necessary preconditions for intelligible experience for science, logic, or morality. It cannot account for the laws of logic, the uniformity of nature, the ability for the mind to understand the world and moral absolutes. In that sense, the atheist worldview cannot account for the debate itself. Now, you might be saying, wait a minute, uh, I'm an atheist and I do believe in the laws of logic. I do believe in the uniformity of nature. I do believe that I have the ability to understand the world and moral absolutes. Christians don't own these things and you'd be right. But if you're an atheist, you can't make sense of or justify those beliefs. And let me tell you, the thoughtful and committed atheist recognizes this as a problem. Duke University philosopher of science and author of The Atheist Guide to the Universe, or Atheist Guide to Reality, Alexander Rosenberg, is one of the atheists who pushes his atheism 
to its logical conclusion. And it's a conclusion that makes other atheists bristle. He presents this in the form of questions and answers. He asks, is there a God? No. What is the nature of reality? What physics says it is. So I'm sure the atheists in the room so far are saying amen or whatever. <laughs> they, they say. What is the purpose of the universe? There is none. What is the meaning of life? Ditto. Why am I here? Just dumb luck. Is there free will? Not a chance. What is the difference between right and wrong, good and bad? There is no moral difference between them. Why should I be moral? Because it makes you feel better than being immoral. Is abortion, euthanasia, suicide, paying taxes, foreign aid, or anything else you don't like forbidden, permissible, or something obligatory? Answer, anything goes. Now I guarantee you, Rosenberg does not live in a manner consistent with those convictions. He knows his atheism cannot justify his experience. And he will live, I would argue, to the joy of his neighbors inconsistently with his rhetoric. See, other premier atheists have come to recognize this inconsistency. Gary Wolf of Wired Magazine in his interview with famous atheist uh, Daniel Dennett, one of the four horsemen of the atheist apocalypse, explains this. And yet, on the other hand, he's writing about his interview with Dennett. Dennett knows that reason alone will fail. And I remember reading this, this really caught my attention. He doesn't want people to lose confidence in what he calls their default settings, by which he means the conviction that their ethical intuitions are trustworthy. Now catch this last quote from Dennett. No rational creature, he says, would be able to do without unexamined sacred things. Friends, that's a remarkable statement for an atheist to make. Now he certainly doesn't appeal to being made in the image of God or general revelation or the Bible in terms of the means by which he accesses his default settings or those sacred things, as obvious and as simple as that might be. But at very least, he is acknowledging that pure atheistic, materialistic evolutionary naturalism cannot justify his experience as a human being. So this very event, this debate that we're at tonight is meaningless from a purely atheistic understanding of reality. Some brains evolved one way, other brains evolved another way, and quite frankly, that's the end of the discussion. So the first test was to ask if you believe in logic. But of course, in light of Rosenberg's statement, I might also ask if you believe in good and evil and right and wrong and justice and accountability. After all, if we are stardust, if we're merely matter in motion, if we are merely molecules flying through space, which we're lucky enough to somehow generate into life, if we're merely the end result of an explosion, how can you believe in accountability? How can you hold a piece of shrapnel accountable for where it lands when a hand grenade explodes? It's irrational. Be that as it may, one more test to see if you can be consistent in your atheism. Now, this is not a test of logic, but of ethics. Perhaps you've seen this photo uh, wafting through the, the internet. Uh, uh, this gentleman's name, it's a sad, sad story. His name is August Landmesser. And this photo is, is true to form. I don't know how well you can see it. I mean, he's in the middle of a bunch of people sig heiling, and he's got his arms crossed. And it, the photo is true to form. That is, he was making a statement. And it was a statement that would soon cost him his life. I mean, he's surrounded by a nation of Sig Heilers, right? That was the zeitgeist. That was the spirit of the age. Yet there he stands with his arms crossed. So my question for you is, was Landmesser right? Was he right in doing that? Now, let me explain the late atheist Gordon Stein argued that Hitler was wrong because he violated Western culture. He argued that Germany was part of the Western European tradition. Astonishingly, Stein made the comment that the Nazi atrocities didn't happen in deep, dark Africa or Mars. 
I have to say, if I were a Martian or an African, I'd be offended by that statement. Are you saying that was okay? it would have been okay if it happened in Africa? Uh, be that as it may, nonetheless, he argued that Hitler didn't have the right to arbitrarily buck Western culture. One might say that there was a culturally transcendent ethic that made Hitler wrong, and therefore, Landmaster is justified in his lack of compliance. But one obvious question has to be, who says Hitler can't buck Western culture? I mean, who made Western culture God? Why is Western culture better than deepest Africa, according to Dr. Stein? But that's not my question. My test for you to ascertain whether or not you, you can be a consistent atheist is this. If Hitler won the war and all of Western culture began to sig heil, if his plans for the Third Reich prevailed and all the world began to sig heil, would you still back Landmesser? Can you sit there and can you still say he's right in what he did? You see, if your answer is, I don't care what history indicates, I don't care how we have evolved, I don't care what Western culture or any culture states, I will stand with Landmesser. Now, it doesn't matter, by the way, for the sake of this test, if Landmesser is a Christian or not. If you're saying what's wrong is wrong, regardless of history, culture, biology, or evolutionary social development, you cannot be a consistent atheist. Your atheism is not reconcilable with your human experience. Dr. Shermer defines moral progress as, quote, increase in the survival and flourishing of sentient beings. So the atheistic naturalist will argue that, quote, determining the condition by which humans best flourish ought to be the goal of a science of morality. Now that sounds noble, but it is fraught with difficulties. I mean, who gets to decide what it means to flourish? And why sentient beings? You know, a sentient being is a, a being who's aware of itself. You see, Dr. Shermer moves from smock to pulpit when he begins to make statements like these. He goes from being scientist to ethicist. Now, I may agree with him, that humans should flourish. But science can't tell me that humans should flourish. Science offers no ought. I mean, what would the answer be to the voluntary human extinction movement, which views sentient beings as a sort of bacteria contributing to the degradation of our environment? I mean, they think half of this room has to go. The, your flourishing as a sentient being means nothing. We need to save the planet. So let me ask you this. If you were presented in this sig heiling world that it is in the best interest for the majority of sentient beings that other sentient beings, the ones with handicaps, the takers, as Dr. Stein might indicate, the ones from Mars or Africa, be eliminated, be extinguished, if that became the destination of our evolution of ethics, would you still stand with Landmesser? Would you say, I don't care what goes on? There's something above us. If that's the case, you can't be a consistent atheist. Now, I was a bit surprised when I heard Dr. Shermer pressed on this issue. He had raised the very sensitive and heartbreaking issue of female genital mutilation. I mean, it's a touchy subject, obviously. But when he was pressed as to how he knew that such a thing was wrong, his answer was anything but scientific. His answer was, just ask the hurt or offended person, their screams will tell you that it's wrong. Now, sometimes people scream because they're hurt and offended, to be sure. But there are also people who scream when you stop them from hurting and offending other people. You see, the just ask method only works if you ask the person that you already know is right. The atheist will always come up short when it comes to justifying their experience, whether it's logic or ethics or anything else. Einstein put it this way. You are right in speaking of the moral foundation of science, but you cannot turn around and speak of the scientific foundation of morality. Every attempt to reduce ethics to scientific formulas must fail. Or in the words of the Apostle Paul, let God be true, but every man a liar. Now, thank you.
Good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing? Can I see the house lights up for a second? I just want to do a quick show of hands. Of, I'm just curious, how many of you believe in God? Oh my, look at the time. Um, <laughs> oh boy. Okay, I have my work cut out for me, I see. All right. Um, well, thank you, uh, Christopher, for, for hosting us and Paul for inviting me here. Our subject tonight is atheism or Christianity, which is reconcilable with the human experience. Why atheism or Christianity? Why not atheism or Judaism or atheism or Buddhism or atheism or Islam? Or for that matter, why not Christianity or Judaism, Christianity or Buddhism or Christianity or Islam? Now, most of us have unfortunately come to know just how powerfully Muslims believe in their faith in certain parts of the world to the point where it drives their actions to do things that we in the West consider uh, uh, abhorrent. Uh, and yet, uh, they hold their beliefs in the same vein that you do, that Christians do. Uh, that is to say, they have a certain set of doctrines that they've come to believe through a holy book that they believe was written by the creator of the universe, and that the prophet has passed down certain uh, doctrines that they hold um, dear uh, by faith and by argument, uh, as do Jews. And yet Jews and Muslims both reject uh, Jesus as the Son of God, the Savior, and the Messiah. So do you realize that by embracing Christian the Christian faith, by embracing Christianity, by being a Christian, you are rejecting the Muslim faith and thereby risking eternal damnation in hell. And I don't suspect a lot of you are losing sleep every night over this, but <laughs> I'm just putting an idea in your head to think about tonight when you go to bed. Um, how do you know? Short of, well, you know, I mean, I was raised Christian. Yeah, I know, but they were raised Muslim and they believe as strongly as you believe. Well, we have better arguments. Well, they make the same statement. They say, well, we have better arguments. How do we determine which side has the better arguments? And, and not just which side, there's not just two. You know, there's hundreds, thousands of faiths in the world. How do you know which is the right one? As for atheism, it isn't really anything. Atheism isn't a belief. It's not a worldview. It just means atheism, without theism, without God. The word was uh, modified slightly in 1869 by um, Thomas Henry Huxley, calling the word agnostic without knowledge, by which he didn't mean uh, waiting for one more experiment or set of data, but it's not knowable. That, that is, you know, the theists believe God is knowable, the atheists believe that God is, it, it doesn't exist, and the, and the agnostics just believe it's not knowable in any kind of scientific sense. Now, I'm an atheist in terms of, you know, my behavior, my, my beliefs about the world. You can't walk around as an agnostic uh, in the sense of, well, as Stephen Colbert told me in the green room when I did a show, uh, Agnostics are just atheists without balls. <laughs> it's like, okay, <laughs> well, I don't want to be one of those. <laughs> and we act on our beliefs in any case. No one walks around in a state of perpetual uncertainty on something that important. Uh, and atheism is not a religion. It's not a worldview. It's not anything. It's like saying I'm an a UFOist or I'm an A-paranormalist. I'm an A-supernaturalist. There's all sorts of things I don't believe. It doesn't mean anything. We can't define ourselves by what we don't believe. We have to define ourselves by what we do believe. Uh, in that sense, I'm, I'm an A-communist or an A-socialist. I don't believe in those. Well, what do you believe? Because what, what difference does it make if you don't believe in those things? Well, I believe in, in free trade and liberty and freedom and democracy and, and so forth. Oh, okay. So that tells you what you do believe. Now, in terms of Christianity, since this is what we're talking about tonight, I, I need to address the main source of that, your holy book. Um, most of Christianity is based on this, at least in the beginning, and the interpretations of it. Um, and I would argue that it's no longer reconcilable with modern human experience. That is to say, 
the book that you believe that the creator of the universe wrote to pass on uh, the doctrines and covenants and, and, and uh, tenets of your faith uh, is not, not only is it not relevant, in some places it's, it's uh, really obscene. I mean, the moral values espoused by these Bronze Age herders and farmers um, is really just a, a series of stories written by and about a bunch of Middle Eastern tribal warlords who are constantly fighting for land and women. It features a jealous and vengeful God named Yahweh who punished women for eternity with the pain of childhood and condemned them to little more than beasts of burden to and sex slaves of the victorious warlords, all for the sin of that autodidact Eve who dared to educate herself by tasting the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and for, and for seducing the first man, Adam, into joining her into choosing knowledge over ignorance. In one of his many foul moods he was wont to fall into, Yahweh committed an epic hemoclism of genocidal proportions by killing every sentient being on earth, including all the animals in a massive flood. In order to repopula repopulate the planet after he decimated it, uh, he commanded his survivors no less than 30 times to be fruitful and multiply. Uh, and rewarded his favorite warlords with as many wives as they desired. With Solomon's voracious appetite for female flesh, topping him out at over a thousand wives and concubines. Guys, if you had sex with a new woman every week, it would take you almost 20 years to match the great and wise King Solomon. Thus was born the practice of polygamy and the keeping of harems, fully embraced and endorsed along with slavery and other practices uh, today that uh, no one would embrace. In the holy book that over two billion people today claim that they get their morality from. As an exercise in moral casuistry, a question in perspective taking comes to mind. Did anyone ask the women how they felt about this arrangement? What about the animals? What did the animals do to deserve this ultimate act of evil? A mass extermination by the God of the Bible because they sinned? Did they worship the wrong God or graven images? What about the millions of people living in other parts of the world, like the Americas? They'd never heard of Yahweh. Did anyone ask them how they felt about being exterminated for not believing in a God they never heard of? Well, I do have some good news for you. <laughs> Fortunately, probably none of this actually happened. Most of the characters in the Bible probably never existed. Moses and the Exodus, for example, there's not a single shred of archaeological evidence spending 40 years in the desert. People almost inevitably leave behind their trash and tools and belongings and artifacts and graffiti and so forth. There's nothing like that at all, so it probably never existed. And Bible scholars tell us that the Bible, in a way, is a wiki. It's a multi-authored, edited volume stitched together over time by writers who, like all writers, political commentators, social commentators, and historians write from the perspective of their own time. And archaeologists and historians tell us that those levels of violence and um, vengeance and sex and so forth were pretty common at that time. That's not the world we live in anymore. In fact, the Bible is what one might expect from the rollout of a 1.0 program designed for Bronze Age farmers and herders. It would be like someone a century from now trying to operate a computer using Windows 98. Just take, for example, something like the death penalty. As it fades into history, America is the last of the 19 prosperous uh, industrial democracies in the world who still has the death penalty. Only 30 of our states still have it. Only four even uh, ever uh, apply the death penalty. Texas, Oklahoma, uh, Florida, and Ohio. And even they can't get the drugs to do it anymore. Most uh, inmates on death row die of old age. Uh, in the Old Testament, the God that you purport to get your morals from uh, commanded that the death penalty, capital punishment, uh, be applied to those who curse or blasphemy the Lord, people who worship another God, witches and wizards, non-virgin brides, and those who work on the Sabbath, and gay men. But by the way, in case there's anyone here who uh, supports gay marriage, 
Um, and by chance, you're also in favor of the legalization of pot. Uh, I noticed in Leviticus 20, 13, it says um, that if a man lies with another man, he must be stoned. So uh, you, 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 can, you, can, you can use that quote if you want to push the moral arc a little further. <laughs> it's kind of a heavy talk, so you know. The book considered by over two billion people to be the greatest moral guide ever produced, inspired as it was, or even written, if you believe that, by an all-knowing, totally benevolent uh, deity, recommends the death penalty for saying the Lord's name at the wrong moment, or at the wrong context, for imaginary crimes like witchcraft, for commonplace sexual relations like adultery, fornication, homosexuality, and for the especially heinous crime of not resting on the Sabbath. How many of today's two billion Jews and Christians agree with their own holy book on the application of capital punishment. That's how far the moral arc has bent in over 4,000 years. I'm predicting that the death penalty will be gone in America by 2025 to 2030. In fact, I claim no one in this room today gets the morality from the Bible, and that's a very good thing indeed. We are thoroughly modern moralists, products of the Enlightenment, secular values, ethical systems that include such basics as People are never to be treated as a means to an end, but they are an end in and of themselves. That comes from Immanuel Kant. People have an inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Of course, Thomas Jefferson, the Declaration of Independence. People have an inherent right to privacy, speech, thought, and action. The U.S. Constitution. Governments may not infringe upon such rights. John Stuart Mill. People should be treated equally under the law. John Locke. Punishment should fit the crime, and society should be based on the greatest good for the greatest number. Jeremy Bentham. Civil rights and civil liberties belong to all people, including blacks, women, and gays and lesbians. The U.S. Supreme Court. These are all purely secular moral values derived from Enlightenment philosophers and scientists, naturalists. There was no word scientist at the time. Natural philosophers. None of it comes from the Bible. I've looked Okay, maybe you're thinking, well, you know, all these men and women who died deserved it because they had free will and they made the wrong choice. Okay, leaving aside animals. What about all the children who die needlessly and innocently in history? We, I've estimated that about 100 billion people have ever lived in history, going back about 50,000 years ago. According to UNICEF, about 29,000 children under the age of five today die every day mainly from preventable causes. That's 21 dead children each minute, 10.6 million a year. That's the equivalent of, of over a Holocaust every year. More than 70% of these 10.6 million children deaths, child deaths are attributed to six causes, diarrhea, malaria, neonatal infection, pneumonia, preterm delivery, or lack of oxygen at birth. Science's response is, well, let's go help them. People like Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, uh, designing programs to solve specific problems like that. Religion's response seems to be something on the order of, this was all part of God's plan. Really, what sort of God would make a plan like this? An all-powerful, all-good God? A less-than-powerful or not-so-good God? Or no God at all? So the moral precept is... Um, as was talked about earlier, is the survival and flourishing of sentient beings. If you want to do something to help, and, and many uh, Christian missionaries and, and, and uh, nonprofits do this, and this is what they need, uh, is to send specific things like potable water, vitamins, vaccinations, mosquito nets, antibacterial drugs, toilet sanitation systems, and so on. The belief that these children, what these children need is salvation from Jesus is somewhere between absurd and obscene. The problem with explaining evil, this is, of course, the problem of evil, uh, for religious people is what I call the irrefutable God problem. When good things happen, who gets the credit? God. When bad things happen, who gets the blame? Not God. So no matter what happens, the God hypothesis is confirmed. So what would disconfirm the God hypothesis? Good things happen, so God is. Bad things happen, so God is. What would have to happen to refute this causal explanation of evil? 
In the Christian worldview, as near as I can tell, nothing can refute it. So what's the difference between an invisible and irrefutable God and a non-existent God? I, I don't see any difference at all. This is like playing baseball without the bases or the ball. For example, if your theory of evil is that your neighbor cavorts with the devil at night, flies around on a broom inflicting people, crops, and cattle with disease, and that the proper way to cure the problem of evil is to burn her at the stake, then you're either insane or you lived 500 years ago in Christian Europe when everybody believed this. It says in Exodus 22, 18, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Today, nobody believes this. Well, hopefully, not in the West anyway. Why? Because science and reason have debunked the witch theory of evil. And that's what's been happening in the last 500 years is that we've been eradicating bad ideas, superstitious ideas, supernatural ideas, and replacing them with natural explanations for these natural Phenomenon. Now, the New Testament. Since many of you will say, well, that was the Old Testament. We have a New Testament. It says it's right there in the title. New. Okay. I will admit it's an improvement over the abysmal doctrines of the Old Testament that I just reviewed. But nowhere in the New Testament does Jesus revoke God's death sentences or his ludicrous laws in Deuteronomy and Leviticus. In fact, quite the opposite. In Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He doesn't even try to edit the commandments or soften them up. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. In fact, if anything, Jesus' morality is even more draconian than the Old Testament. Quote, ye have heard that it was said of them of old time, thou shalt not kill. And so whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. In other words, even thinking about killing someone is a capital offense. In fact, Jesus elevates thought crimes to an Orwellian new level, Matthew 9, 27. Ye have heard that it was said of them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you, thou whoever, that whoever looketh on a woman to lust after he, her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Wow, there pretty much goes the male population of the planet, not to mention most of Congress. Okay. <clears throat> And if you don't think you can control your sexual impulses, Jesus has a practical solution. Quote, if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that, that, that one of thy members should perish and not that the whole body shall be cast into hell. Uh, of course, he's using the eye, but uh, because it's the cleaned up version of which member you should uh, 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 pluck out. <laughs> um, As for Jesus' own family values, he never married, never had children, and he turned away his own mother time and time again. And by the way, when did Jesus become a conservative? Economically, I mean. Uh, the chances of somebody rich getting into the kingdom of heaven, camel through the eye of the needle and so forth. So, finally, my last point here, if I haven't pissed you off yet already. <laughs> uh, one last point. I think we also have an identity crisis problem here, what I call an identity crisis problem. Now, uh, you were mentioned of the triune God. I, I presume you mean the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Yeah. So as the story goes, as I understand it, uh, we were originally created sinless, but because God gave us free will and Adam and Eve chose to eat the forbidden fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, we are all born with original sin. My biggest problem with original sin, by the way, parenthetically, is that I can't think of any. <laughs> They've all been taken. 
Second point, God being omnipotent and omnibenevolent could just forgive the sins that we never committed, but instead he sacrificed his son Jesus, who is actually just himself in the flesh, uh, because Christians are monotheists. I, I, I guess we can debate this later in the exchange we'll have, but I presume one you're a monotheist minute. and the triune is, okay, so one minute, yep. Um, sorry, sorry, two minute warning. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll take what I can get. Uh, you know, triune got three and one, one and three and so on. Anyway, the only way to avoid eternal punishment for the sins we never committed from this all-powerful and all-loving God is to accept his son, who is actually himself, as our savior. So God sacrificed himself to himself to save us from himself. This is barking mad logic. This makes no sense at all. And if you don't accept the logic of that, proposition, you get to spend forever in hell, your flesh seared by fire for all eternity. Why? Because God loves you. Right. Jesus himself said, John 15, six, if a man abide not in me, he casts forth as a branch and is withered and men gathered them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Yikes. In other words, believe me or else. This is not the kind of religion that I think comports well with the modern world that we live in. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shermer. At this time, we'll have 10 minutes from each speaker for rebuttal arguments, beginning with Pastor Paul. Well, you know, Dr. Shermer said so many things, it's hard to address all of them. You know, if you know a little about his history, he went to Pepperdine and he had a religious experience and then he found that theology was too tough, so he went into science. and now teach us theology. <laughs> and I have to say, there are just so many things that could be addressed in terms of what was said, but I just want you to notice a couple of things. One is, um, he's morally offended at things that he writes in the Bible, but what he still hasn't given us is any type of author authoritative basis for that morality. You can appeal to Thomas Jefferson, you can appeal to the Sup Supreme Court, but you don't have any type of absolute authoritative basis because we know the Supreme Court changes. We know that people change their minds. And so that betrays atheism in terms of a worldview that is reconcilable with your experience. You look at, um, and we'll get to this, we don't have time to get to this this evening, but even things about the Trinity, you know, that, that God didn't die on a cross. I mean, I don't know what the understanding of the Trinity is. God doesn't die. Jesus, fully God, fully man, the man Jesus died. And we could talk about all the other religions and, you know, there's the smoke screen that is put out there with a lot of atheists where they go, well, there's 10,000 religions and 1,000 gods and so forth. It's, it's, really, it's really not an accurate assessment. Um, but I'll just say this, and I'll quote John Gerstner on this one in terms of the Christian faith, and that is, there's only one religion that is not auto-soteriological. And what he meant by that is there's only one religion out there where you don't save yourself, and that's the Christian religion, where God, because of his love, sent his son to take upon himself that which we deserved is unique to the Christian faith. And that, re that renders all other religions internally inconsistent. If there's a holy God, there is no way for a sinful man to be united with that holy God apart from some type of atonement taking place, and that is only offered in the Christian faith. So there's all sorts of uh, smoke screens in, in the room. And one of them I, I'd like to address and as we move on here is this smoke screen of the request for evidence. You, maybe you hear that. You're like, I just, I only believe in what I see, many of my atheist friends say. But of course, the very statement, I only believe in what I see, is itself invisible. Therefore, you have a self-refuting starting point, which must be abandoned. But it makes me think of the, the well-known 20th century atheist Bertrand Russell, who in an interview with Leo Rostin, he quipped that if he dies and he sees God, he's going to have this conversation with God, and he's going to confront the Almighty with the words, Sir, you did not give me better evidence. Well... That always had to me a little bit of a Tower of Babel feel to it. Yeah, I, you know, I have to say, there is such a misrepresentation in terms of what the Bible teaches 
going on in the atheistic community. And they all, they all have the same conclusions, which indicates to me that they all have a, simple, a single source in terms of the exposition of the text. Uh, be that as it may, I have always found the Tower of Babel to be almost a silly story in the Bible. Now, I'm not ridiculing the scriptures. What I'm saying is the notion that there is this ultimate human endeavor where you could build a tower into the heavens and somehow reach ultimate truth through a human construction. It, it is the ultimate, you can't get there from here line. That simply doesn't happen. And yet we haven't abandoned that thought. I mean, even as a child, I remember Yuri Gagarin, the Russian cosmonaut, the first man in outer space. And I don't know how true the statement was, but it was, it was going through uh, the newspapers and the television that he got up in outer space and he made the comment, I looked and I saw no God. I mean, even as, I think I was about seven at the time, even then, I wasn't even a Christian. I thought, Is, does any rational person think that he was gonna see God? Is it gonna be like that Star Trek episode where William Shatner gets in an argument with God? Remember that episode? And he outsmarts God because God just can't handle, you know, Captain Kirk's intellect. Is that, what, is that what's gonna happen? But to this very day, the request is still being made. Show me, show me, show me. Let me tell you, whether it's a tower or a spaceship or a microscope or a telescope, God is not found in a lab. He is not found at our human speculations. He is not found by human evidence. You know, there have been apologists who've tried to accommodate this request. Josh McDowell wrote a number of volumes called Evidence That Demands a Verdict, and he gave a tome of evidence, historical, literary, geographical, prophetic evidence, evidence that demands a verdict. And I thought, as I read that, maybe this evidence does demand a verdict, but it doesn't seem to be getting a verdict. And why is that? Well, the question I always ask my atheist friends, I'm gonna probably ask Dr. Shermer, so I'll give you a little, you know, write, write this down. <laughs> what do you require in terms of evidence, and how would that be sufficient to prove to you that God actually exists? Now, I ask, you hear this question going out, and you hear funny answers, you know? Um, I think it was Krauss who said, if the stars rearrange themselves in Aramaic, if the moon split in two, if your pulpit floated up in the air, my esteemed opponent made a less fantastic request, 10 million in a Swiss bank account. Have you checked lately to see? <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> well, wait a minute, check. Okay, check again. <laughs> but of course, any observable phenomenon can have numerous natural explanations. You know, in a day and age when David Copperfield can vanish the Statue of Liberty, one is hard to press to think of any observable event that would necessarily force the conclusion that there must be a God. And you know what? I'm not looking for that because the scriptures teach that there were guards who saw the risen Christ and it didn't make any difference to them. As a matter of fact, one could argue that the two generations in the Bible who saw the most during the time of Moses and the time of Jesus were the most stiff-necked people in all of redemptive history. It doesn't matter. The evidence isn't gonna make a difference, but I'll ask anyway, what evidence do you want and how would that convince you that there is a God? So the demand for and even the providing of empirical evidence, it might make for an interesting evening, but everybody's just gonna look at the data and you know what they're gonna do. They're gonna interpret it through their own assumptions and everybody's gonna be unsatisfied. All this to say the request on the part of the atheist for evidence, whether intentionally or unwittingly, is an illegitimate request. They'll say, well, I'll believe, but I'm gonna exhaust all the natural explanations. Now, how long would it take to exhaust every potential natural explanation for some phenomenon? Well, it would go, it's forever. You'd never get there. You see, with the towers of the, the builders of the Tower of Babel and it would, it would, what Gagarin failed to realize was that which was necessary for there to be a tower in the first place, existence, logic, materials, presupposed the existence of a source, of a genesis. To get started, there needs to be a God. So you hear a lot of this talk with verses that have shock value that are really misinterpreted. They are not, if, you, if we got down and we had a Bible study and we explained what those verses mean, I guarantee you, if you were honest, there would be aha moments to these types of things. 
I've spent my whole life looking at this. As a matter of fact, I would say I, have, I personally have a debt to the neo-atheists because they ask the hard questions and many of the Christians today aren't willing or equipped to answer those tar- hard questions. Two minutes. Does the Bible? Does the Bible teach rape and misogyny and slavery and the unwarranted and capricious killing of children for spilling their milk and everything else that today's atheist says the Bible teaches? Well, it doesn't, but there are verses that if you look at them out of context, if you read your Bible anachronistically, if you fail to understand the big event, you could interpret it that way. I mean, Sam Harris, I assume is a pretty smart guy. But I, heard, I saw him leading a Bible study. It wasn't really a Bible study because he's an atheist, but he was, he was talking about how in this parable, at the end of the parable, Jesus was instructing his followers to kill all the unbelievers. Well, man, I had to run to that parable because I've been reading this all my life and I've never seen the parable where Jesus at the end goes, by the way, go kill all the unbelievers. But any, any Sunday school teacher or, or student could look at that parable and go, no, it's a parable about the second coming. This is the angels. And yet here we have an atheist teaching a Bible study and it panned through the room of people who I think view themselves as intellectuals going, yeah, I can't believe people believe that. Well, you're being taught improperly in terms of what the Bible teaches. One last thing. So many of the atheists today view God in such a puny way. It reminds me of Loki and the Hulk. Remember, we snacks him down in puny God as if God is some type of interloper, as if God is a voyeur, as if God, if he just left us alone, we would be fine. Not recognizing that it is the God in whom we live and move and have our being, and we would not even be here. There is no plausible explanation. You want to talk about theodicy, God and evil? I advise to read God and evil, The Problem Solved by Gordon Clark. It handles the question. You may not like the answer, but it's a reasonable answer. It's a sound answer. But the atheist does not give sound answers and cannot give a justifiable acknowledgement for the life that he experiences. And to say that atheism is not a life and worldview is like saying, look, I'm not committed to walking or not walking. I'm just going to cut my legs off. What a person doesn't believe can tell you a lot about who they are and how they approach the world in which you live. Thank you. Time. Dr. Shermer will now have 10 minutes for rebuttal arguments. Well, that was very interesting. Um, so God, God can't be put in a lab. You can't prove God. Uh, by the way, Bertrand Russell said, sir, uh, at least he addressed God as sir. That's a, that's a, that's a good start. Uh, you did not give me enough evidence. I would say probably like, oh, crap. <laughs> you mean that this is what... Oh. <laughs> I actually wrote a little thing of what I would say to God. It's in one of my other books. Anyway, uh, so you know, I'm not interested in evidence, Paul says. Um, you know, Jesus was resurrected. How do you know? Well, the guards saw the empty tomb. And presumably you'd go on that, you know, other people saw the risen Christ. They, images came to them. Thomas famously put his finger in the slit in the flank and so forth. That's evidence. That's, that's not just saying I don't care about evidence. I mean, if you say, look, I, I believe that uh, Jesus died for my sins. So, okay, and I can't prove it, it's just what I believe. Well, it's really the end of the conversation. There's not much more I have to say about that, but other than I might ask, how do you know? If you say, I don't care how I know, I just believe, okay. Uh, but then there's not much more to say, but, but, but we're, we're really talking about, it's all comes down to evidence, unless it's an internal, subjective state of mind. One of my favorite books is uh, the late, great Carl Sagan's Demon Haunted World, and one of his chapters is called, There's a Dragon in My Garage. I have a dragon in my garage. Really? Can I see it? Yeah, 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 yeah. So you open the garage door up, and you look inside, and you see a few paint cans, a ladder, a bicycle, but... There's no dragon. Well, where's the dragon? Ah, well, this is an invisible dragon. An invisible dragon? Oh, yeah, they're really cool. Well, how about we spread some flour on the floor, and then when the invisible dragon walks, we'll see the footprints. Uh, You see, this dragon hovers above the ground about three feet. Okay, no problem. I have have an infrared camera here, and and it detects heat. Well, you see, this is a cold-blooded dragon. It doesn't give off heat. 
Well, I have a flame detector. It detects fire. And this dragon, it uses cold fire. Okay, Carl's point is, what's the difference between an invisible, indetectable dragon and no dragon at all? At some point, you have to have evidence for it of some kind or another, or you're just making an assertion. I just assert it so. Well, that's nice. I mean, I traffic in a lot of different subjects at Skeptic Magazine, and I believe in Bigfoot. That's nice. Show me the body. And I'll believe. I believe aliens have visited Earth. That's nice. Show me the evidence. Now, these folks have evidence, and we look at it, the quality of the evidence, and so forth. These are propositions. People make propositions. I propose that there's 421 people in the room tonight. Well, we can answer that objectively, clearly, un unmistakably, lights up, count everybody, boom. I'm either right or I'm wrong. Dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago. A little harder of a problem than counting the number of people in the room, but we can get at the answer through the radioactive decay of volcanic uh, flows below and above the fossil uh, finds and, and, and get an estimate with well-defined error bars of you know, plus or minus and so forth. And consistently over time, if enough evidence comes in, we can say, we're pretty confident 65 million years ago. The universe began with the Big Bang. Overwhelming evidence for this. Jesus was crucified. Probably Jesus really existed. The Romans crucified people right and left. I mentioned the death penalty. Uh, and uh, in modern America, well, the Romans practice this quite, uh, quite readily. As you know, Jesus, two, two common thieves were crucified. They were you know, capital punishment, put to death for just uh, pickpocketing. Jesus died for your sins. Now, that's a different category of proposition. Not so easily to prove as a historical fact like dinosaurs, big bangs, or crucifixions. America is the greatest nation on God's green earth, as my friend Michael Medved says at every commercial break. <laughs> I like Michael. He's, I've been on his show many times. He's a good guy. But my wife's from Germany, and she begs to differ. Oh, by the way, she said to mention uh, to you, Paul, that uh, enough of the Hitler stuff. <laughs> my poor wife got here two years ago to be with me, if you can believe that. <laughs> I'm still in shock about it myself in a good way. Uh, you know, so we just late night channel surfing, and it's just Hitler every night, every channel. Hitler, Hitler, Nazis, Nazis, Hitler. It's like, you know, we don't even talk about Hitler anymore in Germany. You guys can't have to get over this thing. <laughs> I mean, in any debate, how many minutes before Hitler comes out? I and mean, it's just, okay, enough. <laughs> Meditation makes me feel better. Okay, that's a subjective internal state. It's true for me. Meditation works by which not just for me, for you, for anybody that employs it in this particular methodology and so forth. That's a harder proposition to test, but it, it has now been tested. It does work for a number of uh, important stress-related hormones and things like that. I prefer dark chocolate over milk chocolate. Well, I mean, you really should, but, but that's of course a subjective state, can't really prove it. For me, it's true, but may not be for you. The meaning of life is 42. Okay, thank you for those who are Douglas Adams fans. Stairway to Heaven is the greatest rock song of all time. Okay, that's an objective truth. No, just kidding. Okay, um, in other words, there are propositions that we can test, we can gather evidence, even historical questions. Uh, we can assign probabilities, very likely to be true, unlikely to be true. Uh, and the nature of the claim, the more extraordinary the claim, the more extraordinary the evidence needs to be for it. Again, aliens visited Earth, that's an extraordinary claim. How, how, how good is the evidence? Not very good, unfortunately. It would be one of those things I would love to be true. Uh, I don't think it is. Um, and so this is the principle of proportionality. We must proportion our beliefs to the evidence. And this should apply to anything. Uh, and, and, and we have been doing this. This is what has been bending the arc of the moral universe for 500 years. We've been trying to solve not just physical problems in the physical sciences and biological problems in the biological and medical sciences, but also in the social sciences. What is the cause of crime? How do economies grow or shrink? What causes inflation? What's the best way to structure a government? Uh, you know, how, should we, uh, incre how should we decrease the homicide rate in inner cities? Uh, you know, should we have more gun control or less gun control? 
You know, should we have a progressive tax or a regressive tax or a flat tax? These are propositions. Controversial to be sure, not easy to answer, but we can as assess data and, and, and at least vote on it, at least make a rational decision on it. And so I make this transition uh, and, and no distinction between um, pr propositions about the physical universe, the biological universe, or the social and moral universe. I think it's, it's all just knowledge. It's just propositions that we make about the factual state of the, of the world. Where do these morals come from? Well, okay, so there's two, two, two things to distinguish. There's Minutes. The, there's the in, internal moral uh, sense, the, the sense of right and wrong. You know, I listen to the still small voice within, you listen to the still small voice. Where does that come from? All right, well, in, in another book, I have a whole argument for why we evolved a sense of right and wrong as a social species. We have to get along with each other. Um, behavioral game theory explains this nicely, why you should employ a tit-for-tat strategy in dealing with others, why it's good to be pro-social, cooperative, altruistic, and so on. Not just good for the other person, and good for me, good for our group, and so on but not in any calculating way. Like, I'm only doing this for Machiavellian manipulation reasons. No, no, because people could tell if you're faking or not. You actually have to believe it. Like, I really genuinely feel good about helping other people. And we now know, studies, brain scan studies, and, uh, and, and uh, blood testing studies, you know, dopamine levels go up, oxytocin levels go up when you help people and you're nice to other people and so on. It's good, it's a good thing. It's part of our nature. We are born knowing right from wrong. And uh, so in my final closing statement, I'll explain a little bit more about that. But, but, but Paul asks, why should you be good? Because it's good to be good. Because that's the way you would like to be treated. This is the principle of interchangeable perspectives. I can't argue with you that you should be nice to me because, you know, I'm me and I'm super cool. And I just happen to be standing on this particular spot. And it's the most special spot in the universe. You are not going to take that argument seriously. You will take the argument seriously. Well, you should be nice to me because, you know, I'm going to be nice to you. That's a superior uh, moral principle, and it starts right there and builds from there. Thank you. At this time, we'll have five minutes for cross-examination, but actually we'll be starting with you, Dr. Shermer. Uh, we're on our first name base here, so i just going to start with Paul. To... So, Paul, uh, where do you get your morals from? Special revelation, the scriptures of the Old New Testament. Wait, so special revelation, that, that sounds different than scripture. No, it's, those are synonymous word terms. Okay, all right. So it's not like, so you're reading it somewhere. Yes. So you must pick and choose from, I mean, you must dismiss all those passages I painfully read through. No, I, I try to read them in context. <laughs> okay. How do you explain that the creator of the universe couldn't even get it right about slavery. I think there's a grotesque misunderstanding of the way many atheists understand the use of the word slavery in the Bible as if it's always being used the way it was used in America. And the Bible teaches that man stealing is a, is a sin, a crime, kidnapping is a crime. The Bible uses slavery in different ways. It uses it in terms of indentured servitude that's voluntarily paying off a debt by being a voluntary slave. It also uses it in terms of um, prisoners um, of war. Uh, it's used in terms of prisoners who are domestic as well. What you see, for example, absent in the Bible are penitentiaries and penal colonies. What you have is people become slaves. And so instead of going to prison, they actually pay off the person that they were stealing from, and the government more or less stays out of it. So why, but, but why couldn't the creator of the universe put, put something in the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not enslave thy fellow man outside of those conditions. That may be so simple to do. Thou shalt not molest children. Thou shalt not you know, rape women and so on. This is, well, those are in there. Well, sort of. I mean, <laughs> Well, they're in there strongly. And there is a sense in which God... Understand it like this. You, you, you start reading the Bible, and if you read a small portion of it, this, and I, I stole this from Ted O, who is probably here. And you read a portion of it, and it's like reading that uh, the hero of the story right away is swallowed by the bad dragon. And so you just quit reading because you're like, this is a terrible story and the dragon wins and everything's awful. And if you read longer, you realize that the hero's not dead. He's in the dragon and he's got a sword. And in three days, he's going to come out and he's going to kill the dragon and there'll be victory. 
And you have to read the Bible that way, that it is God's overarching plan to overcome the sin of man, overcome slavery, but it would be done by changing the hearts of men one at a time through the gospel. Now, the moral principles that uh, you believe to be true that God gave us somehow through scripture, I guess, uh, wouldn't those stand anyway, whether there's a God or not? Aren't those just good things to do because that's how you would want to be treated? What, what, what good does it do adding the God element into that equation? Well, first of all, if there was no God element, there would be not only no good or evil, there would be no us. Uh, the very, our very existence is dependent upon there being an, et- being an eternal, self-existent God from whom all things were created. You, you mean the creation of us physically? Or, creation yeah, of okay, us yeah, physically, yeah. but no, also... I, but I just mean morally. I, I mean, shouldn't you just do... Isn't it just inherently, in its own, for its own sake, good to do it? What, what, why, what, why add the, 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 the element of God and the supernatural element and there's going to be a a heaven and a yeah. hell and so forth. What? No, I get your question. I guess what I'm trying to explain is that the whole notion of good doesn't exist apart from God. When the Bible says God is good, it is not, it is not saying that there's good and then there's God. And then he goes to a library somewhere and he finds good. And then he kind of employs that which he found somewhere else. The whole notion of goodness is an extension of the character and nature of God. Apart from God, the the word that you're using and what you mean when you say it doesn't even exist. But, okay, so I I would agree that there's no such thing as good or evil outside of human action and thoughts. If if there's no life, sentient life anywhere on earth, there's no morals, there's no good or evil. It it has to do with how we treat one another, how we interact with each other. But if you think, that's not what I said, if you're agreeing with me. That's what I'm saying. Okay, yeah. (laughs) And, and, And then you would, of course, agree with me. (laughs) <laughs> no. Would you agree with me? No, I, I wouldn't agree. Okay, there, I, I, yeah, let yeah, me yeah. just say it again. There's no sentient life at all. On, make it Mars, okay? Is there, are, is there good and evil on Mars? I think good and evil exists. On Mars, on some other planet? It, it exists as an immaterial transcendent. Okay, so it's, all right. So in the theological, in a metaphysical sense. Yeah, in the metaphysical sense. In other sense. words, there's something out there called evil that... And how do you suppose it influences human minds? I mean, does it actually get right in there to the neurons and causes testosterone to go up and the males become more violent and they commit more homicides or something like this? What, what drive, what's the mechanism? Yeah, I wouldn't say that it's a purely material thing. I think that it's a combination of what is taking place in our souls, in our immaterial, but I think it affects the way we respond materially as well. I don't, I'm not a Gnostic. I don't think that material is itself evil. I think that... When God made everything, it was concrete and it was good. And I don't believe in demon rum. I don't think there's something evil in the rum. I think it's in our natures, but I think it does affect our carnality. It does affect our physicality. Time. Now there will be cross-examination by Pastor Paul. All right, uh, Michael, if I may. Um, You had had made the, the statement in your book that ethics are both provisional and transcendent. And um, I mean, normally people view those as contradictory terms, but I understand in your book, you kind of, you know, altered those a little bit. Would you say that's true of logic as well? Is is logic both provisional and transcendent? Yes, I would. I mean, there there are truths that, okay. So when we talk about proof and truths in math and logic versus say science, physics and so on, and then personal truths that I mentioned, I think those are different categories. So it would depend on the specific proposition. You know, two plus two is is four. It's it's true anywhere in the universe just by definition. Something like milk chocolate is not as good as dark chocolate. That's a purely subjective. And then there's a whole scale in between. So yes, By, by provisional, I mean we all pretty much agree on it to the extent that we can as humans. So it's not the same as your transcendence. Right. So it's possible that in time, um, both ethics and logic will change. Well, yes, of course. Uh, Well, all right. So I'm claiming in the moral arc that it has been changing in in the right direction, three steps forward, two steps back, moral progress. But by by what definition? By the survival and flourishing of sentient beings. There's more people with more rights, more freedom and liberty and autonomy than any time in history. That's a real moral progress. That's changing. Yes, it changes. Okay, so in light of the question or the statement you just made, other than telling them that they're just crazy, 
How would you respond to the voluntary human extinction movement who understands the sentient human beings as a problem that has to be extinguished? Okay, I, I don't really know that group too careful. I have to look them up. <laughs> well, we know they're wrong. This would be the equivalent of something like the, um, the trolley problem, but where the doctor has uh, a sick patient or f five, five sick patients about to die and one healthy person and he kills the person, takes the organs and saves the five people. Why, why isn't that a moral good? That's sort of a utilitarian argument. The reason he would go to jail for murder is because we, we value the single individual life and the autonomy of life above uh, making a sacrifice for the, for the many in a utilitarian argument. Why? Because I think we've been progressing more and more toward a recognition of individual uh, liberty and autonomy and so forth as the fundamental unit of moral valuation because we wouldn't want to live in a world where you could be walking down the street and someone says, you're the one we're going to sacrifice because th that would lead to a, a chaotic uh, totalitarian type state. Okay. Uh, do you, in light of the fact that we are the end result of an explosion, matter in motion, molecules flowing through space, uh, do you believe that human beings should be accountable, and by accountable, I don't mean just accountable, but is there actual guilt? And if so, how can there be accountability or guilt if we are just the end result of an explosion? Uh, because, well, uh, first of all, I, uh, I'm a compatibilist on the free will uh, issue. That is to say, I think we live in a determined universe, but we make choices, and our choices are part of the causal net of the determined universe, but they're still your choices. You don't know all the factors influencing you. You still have many degrees of freedom. You could have done this, you could have done that. With the exceptions that the law already accounts for, you know, somebody who's brain damaged, severely retarded, and so forth, and the law already just for those kinds of uh, punishments. So yes, but, but taking out the extremes. Yes, we are morally accountable. We make free choices, and we are culpable for our actions in almost all cases. You're saying that in a real sense, that we are not just an effect of an explosion because there are so many things taking place that we actually have real autonomous freedom? Yes, I do. Not, not in the libertarian free will sense. N not the Ron Paul libertarian, but the idea that there's like some, some other choice maker inside your brain, like a soul. And, and by the way, that doesn't give you free will. That just ratchets it back to some other causal agent. It's not you making the choices, it's your soul making the choices for you, or it's the little, you know, little mini-me inside there. But if there's a mini-me directing me to make choices, then there has to be a mini-mini-me inside mini-me directing the choices, and a mini-mini-mini-me, <laughs> and so on. So there's no way around the reductio ad absurdum there. Right. Ultimately, you don't know all the causal vectors uh, influencing you, genes, upbringing, and so forth, neither do I. So, uh, so that, we are essentially making, it's a useful fiction, we're making free choices, and society absolutely depends on holding people morally accountable. But, but they're probably not free in a very autonomous sense. Then. Not, probably they, not they in the way you mean. They have to be mean. attached to the, the past. Some, well, yeah, well of course, we all are. Right. You know, you didn't choose to be born in America and right. be white and so forth, and neither did I. And you were given the intelligence you were, you think, by God, whatever. Anyway, so... Uh, uh, one last question then, yeah. you know, I quoted Einstein, at the end of the quote he said, every attempt to reduce ethics to scientific yeah. formulas must fail. Of course, you've made a career out of kind of establishing uh, uh, the, the morality of science and the science of morality. How would you respond to, to Einstein? Well, Einstein also believed in that we should uh, have a one world government and, and, and share our nuclear secrets with everybody, okay? Not everybody can leave one area of science and go into some other field and, and, and come up with the right answers. I just think he was wrong. And, and, and to be fair, I, most of my fellow scientists and philosophers think I'm wrong about um, that science can determine human values or at least understand them and, and, and make decisions on them. Uh, but I think this is the way we're going. I think I'm right on this one. I could be wrong. Uh, and it could be Einstein's right about that. And he's in the majority in that sense. But uh, I think we are already doing that. We're already doing that. Now, do you believe in absolutes? Do you believe well, in truth and logic and... Probably not in the way you mean, no. But I'm not a relativist either, so let's get out of the categorical right. thinking, you know. Well, you've got to be in there somewhere. It, 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 well, like. I'm, I'm pretty close. I'm, you know, right. I, I'm not one of these postmodern deconstructionists, you know, that believes that, you know, it, it, yeah, I'm absolutely against that, uh, that, rel that relativism, cultural relativism. It's a big, big mistake. You made the comment, it's good to be good. Why? 
in a, in a very well, authoritative sense. Okay, well, in, in the sense that I, I, I would like people to treat me well, it, it, it's the golden rule, all right? Mm -hmm. So religions were the first on the scene to figure this out. It makes perfect sense. And it turns out that uh, there's good reasons for this. I mentioned behavioral uh, uh, game theory explaining how this works, and it turns out this is, this is right. But, not, but, 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 but the Jesus ethic of just always turning the other cheek is also not good. And this is why we have a principle of deterrence and why we keep nuclear weapons. You can't just always forgive, you know, crazy people. They're dangerous, all right? So. Yeah, and I would agree with you. I think yeah, sure. the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus isn't, he's talking personally. He's not yeah, talking yeah, about you know. Right? But sorry, even, you know, I, you should love your neighbor. I, well, you know, I don't really love my neighbors. I respect them. I respect their rights and so on. Some of them I like, some of them I don't even know. Uh, I just want them to leave me alone, and I'll respect them. Time, respect gentlemen. Me. You know, it's like... At this time, we'll have five minutes of closing arguments by Dr. Shermer, followed by five minutes of closing arguments by Pastor Paul. I had a few notes here, but maybe... Okay. Uh, well, as mentioned, I went to Pepperdine. I was a born-again Christian um, in high school and through college uh, into graduate school, so I understand the religious impulse and the logic behind the arguments uh, when you're, you know, in that bubble, uh, it, there's a certain internal consistency and coherency to uh, the Christian worldview. Uh, I recognize that fully. Uh, and I used to, um, you know, I used to witness to people. I'd go door to door, Amway with Bibles, you know, tell them about Jesus. And then I became an atheist and I went back to those same doors. And said, I take it all back. No, it <laughs> no I did uh, I took a course in the writings of C.S. Lewis, for example, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the writings, the life of Jesus. And so I, I, know, the, I, I know the worldview, but um, one of the things that led me to uh, leave the faith was just a, a, a getting out of the bubble and, and experiencing other worldviews, other traditions, other religions, people in other countries, and so forth. It's one of the values of travel, for example, is to see, well, these are good people, and they're different from me. They believe just as strongly as I do. How do I know I'm right? And that's when I kind of began my journey of, you know, sort of studying epistemology, science, reason, logic, and so on. How do we know uh, what it is we believe? And, you know, one of the things for me was just um, talking to other people, studying other cultures, anthropology, for example, the sociology of, of religion, the psychology of religion. Clearly, lots of people think they're, you know, they're the right ones. But how do you know which is the right one? I think often in cases like this, there isn't a right answer in, in, in like these big questions. Um, and I think I've made the case tonight that Christianity, at least as it's represented, particularly in the Bible and these arguments, is not reconcilable with at least modern human experience. It's fully understandable how and why religions evolved as they did. You know, as these small bands of hunter-gatherers began to coalesce into larger states, chiefdoms, and states and empires, from a few dozen to a several hundred to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands, there had to be some means of, of social control. You gotta have rules and, uh, and laws and so forth. And so government and religion evolved pretty much simultaneously. It's fully understandable how it evolved and we continue to evolve, finding more and more ways for more people to uh, you know, flourish, survive and flourish. And, and I think I'm optimistic that way. And to the extent that religions and, and people, good people like Paul are out there helping other people, then I really don't have a problem with religion. But clearly, you know, the elephant in the room we all uh, see on the news pretty much every night, not all religions are like that. And, uh, and, and the problem is, is that the, those people have the same confidence in their propositions being true, really true, uh, not just psychologically true or true for me and the world's a big enough place where we can all uh, just have the lion and the lamb you know, sleep together without conflict. No, uh, there are people who believe that unless every knee is bowed, they will not uh, sleep safely in their beds. That is part of the danger of religion uh, that worries me. It's not that I'm out to convert, make people atheists. Again, it's not a thing. I want people to embrace civil rights and civil liberties and freedom and autonomy and prosperity and, you know, all the things that pretty much most conservative Christians today believe. So I think, you know, we're kind of on the same path. It's just, you know, what's, where did it come from and how do we get there? 
I suppose, is, is the difference. Um, but the moment you move into these kind of supernatural realms, this is also what makes me nervous in terms of like the, the dragon. How do you know there's a dragon there? At some point when we make propositional claims, Jesus rose from the dead, okay, that's an extraordinary claim. Is the evidence in proportion to that? Is it extraordinary evidence? Uh, I think not. So there I you know, would say it's okay to be a little skeptical. Take the precepts that make sense from One our minute. little internal state and so forth and move from there. In the long run, I'm optimistic. I'm not sure uh, you know, that religion will fade in the next few decades. But the fastest growing religious group in, a, in America, in the West, are the nuns. N-O-N-E-S, the people that check the box for none, no religious affiliation. They're not necessarily atheists, agnostics, freethinkers, skeptics, whatever. Um, they just don't go to church. They don't belong to any organized religion. I think that's good uh, because those are the people that we all want, the undecided voters, so to speak, uh, to embrace um, you know, the values that we uh, uh, cherish in the Western world uh, without, re regardless of what religion you are. Those are values that we should hold. Freedom, prosperity, autonomy, liberty, choice, and, and, so, and, and, and so forth. Those are the kinds of things that I think we all agree are valuable, real. And I, we only disagree on where they came from. Thank you. In, uh, when I first started writing <clears throat> for this debate, my opening line was, many of you are going to be frustrated because in debates people talk past each other. And... Um, and in a certain sense, that's just the way it is. You know, uh, Dr. Trummer's a scientist, and he's asking for evidence. I'm, a, I'm an apologist. I believe in the transcendental argument for the existence of God, and that is, apart from acknowledging the existence of God, you can't prove anything at all. In other words, apart from acknowledging the existence of God, you don't even know what to do with the evidence. Um, I opened this evening by conveying a fear of violating the third commandment. And I hope um, that that's been achieved. I hope that the things we've spoken of, at least from my part, has demonstrated a, a love for my opponent and respect for the word. Sophistry can be ugly and irritating. And um, it was also my prayer that this event would be redemptive. You know, we, we speak of logic and ethics and good and evil we, be, we speak about the things we know. I mean, there's this, there's this, why doesn't God just show us? Why can't we somehow find him in our pursuits? But let me tell you, friends, God is not found at the end of our intellectual pursuits. The fear of the Lord is not at the end of our pursuit. The fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. Apart from acknowledging God, we can't know anything at all. It's not the end. Knowing God is not the end of an academic quest. Can you imagine if that were the case? That would, that would turn the Christian faith into a religion of tribal intellectual elites. Only the people smart enough to discursively reason from the evidence to the creator would be Christians. And God has not left us at the mercy of our own inabilities as creatures. John Calvin, the great reformer, had a phrase he called the sensus divinitatis, the sense of the divinity. It wasn't a feeling, it was a knowing. This, this thing we had, I wanna, why isn't God making himself known? He's like, no, you know. The apostle Paul talked about that in the first chapter of Romans. There is within the human mind and indeed the natural instinct an awareness of the divinity of God. Of course, this knowledge may be comforting or it may be horrifying. The knowledge of God may be good news or it may be bad news. The Apostle Paul said, we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. In other words, he's like, we're putting off the same scent. To the one, we are the aroma of death, leading to death, and to the other, the aroma of life, leading to life. You see, the knowledge, the mere knowledge of God is not necessarily a source of peace or contentment. A little more than a thousand years before Calvin, 
there was Augustine. And he had conveyed a very similar thought to Calvin. He said this, Thou movest us to delight in praising thee, for thou hast formed us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in thee. Let me just challenge you. I know we have more Christians in here than non-Christians. It should be the goal of every Christian in this room and of those who are listening afterward to aid our neighbors in finding rest in Christ. Spurgeon, in a style that is truly Spurgeon-esque, wrote this. He said, if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. If they will perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees. Let no one go there unwarned and unprayed for. Or the Apostle Paul put it this way, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, his fellow countrymen, according to the flesh, is that they might be saved. So friends, I pray this has been more than a mere intellectual exercise. I'd like to see everyone in this room found by the peace and grace of God. I want to, I like you. I, I want to be with you forever. I want to, there, yeah. Uh, Michael, when I, read your, when I read your story, it, it grieves me. I feel like you were presented a God who promised things that he didn't give and other things were neglected, even greater things. I want to see, I want, I want us to all be in the glory of that holy, eternal communion, enjoying God, glorifying him, and enjoying one another forever. And that is my prayer. Amen. Thank you. At this time, we'll have some question and answer for the audience. There are only a couple of rules to this. The first rule is do not hog the mic. Uh, the second is have a clear idea in mind of what you want to ask and direct it to a particular speaker. So if you'll raise your hand, uh, we'll, come, we'll come to you. Question, question I have, you brought up the, the idea of evidence, you know, and... Uh, one of the wonderful things about the Bible, it covers everything if you really take it in its total totality. And it, it tells us that we're not going to have an excuse because the evidence is so plain. We have a creation. Somebody created that. It just didn't happen. Stephen Hawking's started out to prove that there was no God. Now, one of the things that I see going on here is you're trying to prove Christianity isn't true. I haven't heard you talk too much about the fact that you don't believe, you did say you don't believe in God, but there must be something out there because we have evidence of a creation. And to say that we have a creation, but there's no creator doesn't make any kind of sense at all. Something, somebody had to create that. Now, Stephen Hawking spent his whole life trying to prove that there's no such thing as something that doesn't begin, doesn't have a beginning, and doesn't have an ending. And he's pretty much given up on that now because the universe, that telescope, told him a lot. And then they got a bigger one going up that's going to make that one look like a toy. Yeah. I think and, I got it. Yeah, no, I think I, think I got it. It's a, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good question. So... Well, a couple, a couple of things. Uh, you know, evidence is everything uh, in terms of all these propositions I mentioned, even love. You know what you call love without evidence? Stalking. <laughs> Think about it, right? You want a little evidence every day from your sweetheart. Still love me? Yeah, I still love you. Yeah, of course, right? So everything requires that. Stephen Hawking's probably not your best example because he's an atheist and he said so publicly many times. His last book, um, The Grand Design, he co-authored with uh, my friend Leonard uh, Malad now. He's also a physicist at Caltech. Uh, they showed how a universe can arise out of nothing, out of, okay. When theologians talk about nothing, they mean something different than what, when <laughs> physicists talk about nothing. And, when, and so here we're starting to bump up against um, the limitations of language and cognition. There's you know, how, how can you have an infinite number of, of, uh, of numbers in which the, just the even numbers 
There's just as many even numbers as there are total whole numbers. How can that be? I mean, there's certain of these kind of conundrums of, of, of epistemology that bump up against the ontology of the way the universe really is. And there's just certain things. What was there before the universe? Well, you know, there's, there's ideas about this. The quantum foam fluctuation, universes just pop into existence. There may be a near infinite number of universes. Uh, this is not my favorite uh, explanation for the origins of our universe, but there are people uh, attempting to uh, apply that. So ultimately, we're looking for natural explanations. The moment you say, there had to be a supernatural creator. How do you know? How do you know? I mean, what, what's wrong with just saying we don't know? Well, and, and if you know, God reaches in to stir the particles to somehow create a new universe or a new life or whatever, how did he do it? How does he stir the particles to cure somebody's cancer that you pray for, for example? How does this work? There's no explanation for that. All right, so my question's for uh, Pastor Paul. I feel like uh, some of your logic or reasoning in regards to things like good or logic and where does it come for is simply creating a problem of degrees of where the naturalist says, well, it exists and it comes from us and you're saying, no, it doesn't, it comes from God. My question is when you push this to God, does that not then create the same problem for God? Um, if God creates or says something is good, is it good because it is good or is it good because God says it's good? Um, it seems to just push the problem further back and now there needs yeah. to be an answer for God and so right. on and so forth. A little bit like the mini-me inside the mini-me right. mm -hmm. Dr. Schirmer mentioned. No, it's a good question and it does have an answer. I mean, it, that is that classic, is it good because God calls it good or is, does, it call, is, is it, does, does God call it good because it's good? There is an answer to that. It's good because it's an extension of the character and nature of God himself. So it's not something happening exterior to God. It's not, like I said, it's not God going into a library and finding that which is good, or taking something that is outside of himself. When the Bible says things like God is good, or God is just, or God is truth, these are not just uh, words to describe some attribute of God, these are words to describe the source of those things. So something is good because it is an extension of the character and nature of God himself. And it ends there, it's, and that's eternal though, that's as far back as it goes. But I also want to, you know, I mean, to how jump do we on. know it? That's as far back as we as it goes. Why can't there be a God's God who's even better than this God? Well, that's the whole idea of eternally self-existent. See, what we have is you get you. There's a little bit of a shell game going on, and it's funny. I look out here, and you have a guy, a real smart guy like Lawrence Krauss, writing a book called The Universe from Nothing, and and then all of a sudden we have this little phrase. Well, you know, his definition of nothing might be a little different than your definition of nothing. Because basically what he's saying is there's nothing and then you apply the laws of physics and then there's something. But I asked my kids the question. I go, do you see a problem with that? And they're like, yeah, if there's nothing, what, else, what is there? No, there is no laws of physics. But, but if there's nothing, then there's no God either. No, there is an eternal self-existent God. Okay, why can't the universe be an eternally self-existing, uh, self-defined unit? Well, there's an answer I mean, to that these, too. These are just words where you call it God, I say universe. These are just, again, we're bumping up against but language not, but, limitations. But if you're asking the question, there's an answer to that question as well. The universe, it is, it is agreed upon at this point that time and matter can't be eternal. For example, the idea that there's a, the universe goes back eternally you think about this just for a second. If time went back eternally, we could never get to today. I mean, think about it. If you got, some of you drove an hour to get here because you lived 40 miles away. What if you lived 100 miles away? How long would it take you? What if you lived 1,000? What if you lived 10,000? What if you lived infinitely far away? How long would it take for you to get here? In LA traffic? Oh boy. <laughs> But you see what's going on here, you would never get here. Yes, but of course that's only within a self-contained universe. There may be multiple bubble universes, there may have been universes before ours, we don't know. We no, just it's, don't it's, know. It's still, the whether there's multiverses or bubble verses doesn't make any difference. The temptation to stop the causal chain where you want it is understandable, but why stop it there? Well, you're not where did God come from? He's okay. eternally self-existent. Okay, gentlemen, now, we're gonna take another question. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think this is better. If you ask. Anyway. Sorry to uh, break this up. Uh, okay. Questions for Pastor Paul. Uh, listening to the debate tonight, kind of think back of if we were back in biblical days, Old Testament, New Testament, you know, how would this argument be 
received and kind of what, would, what proof would be offered on both sides. And I think on uh, the Christian side or the, you know, the, Jew, the Jewish side, uh, miracles were often performed, right? So when Moses was talking to Pharaoh, you know, he would, you know, bring, you know, match plague for plague. He would part the Red Sea. Jesus, uh, you know, provided fish to, to people. He rose from the dead. Those are actionable kind of testable miracles that convince people based on events. And it wasn't kind of a, an appeal to, you know, mystery or revelation, but it was actually, I'm showing you why you should believe because I'm doing something that's extraordinary. And so my question is over the last 2000 years, kind of what's become of these miracles, right? If that was the evidence that was required back in the day when Jesus and, and, and the apostles were around, um, you know, why should our standard of, of evidence be any lower? Why, why, what, what happened to miracles? Okay, so the question, well, you guys can hear the question. What we have to recognize is that miracles, super, signs, the word miracle, by the way, is not in the Bible. You have signs and wonders, and you've got this idea of these supernatural events taking place at the hands of certain people, prophets, Jesus, apostles. And what those miracles did, what those signs and wonders did was authenticated who they were. But what I think is, uh, was, you know, and I, it's a good question, but I think the error of the question is that somehow these convinced people as I think I mentioned in the debate, the two most stiff-necked generations in all of redemptive history were those who lived during the time of Jesus and those who lived during the time of Moses. I think we underestimate the hardness of the human heart when we think that seeing signs and wonders can actually circumcise our hearts. It didn't circumcise their hearts. Jesus said to Thomas, you know, blessed are you because you have seen, but blessed is him who does not see and yet still believes. See, because God has given us something much greater than signs and wonders. Jesus said, it's an evil and adulterous nation that looks for a sign. He's given us the census divinatitatis. He's given us the knowledge that he exists in our minds. We know it. We don't have to look at signs and wonders. Signs and wonders were there for the purpose of canon, for the canon of scriptures. Uh, they weren't there to put on a show. You look at Jesus, he performed all these signs and wonders. And then 5,000 people would follow him, 10,000 people would follow him, and then he'd give a sermon and everybody would walk away. They just weren't that impressive. They weren't designed for that purpose. They were de designed so that we would have the canon of the text. And what I mean by that is the Bible, the Old New Testament. Hi, oh wow, that's much louder than I anticipated. Um, and now everybody, this is terrifying. Okay, um, my question is for both of you, probably, but specifically for Pastor Paul, it seems like the biggest thing to discuss in this debate is the character of God, either, either for or against. That seems to be what's being pulled around. Atheists say the character of God is evil, and that's why we shouldn't believe in him, and Christians say the character of God is good, which is why we have good. My question is, uh, it was briefly mentioned, but uh, the doctrine of hell wasn't really touched on. And my, I'm curious as to how the doctrine of hell is proof within the character of God that we should believe in a good God who sends people to hell for eternity while only being evil for maybe 20, 15, even if they live for 90 years, and how I can weigh that goodness on my own sense of morality and goodness if I am just a being who is evolutionarily dictated to understand good and evil. Does that make sense? Well, let me, if you're asking me first, yeah. uh, let me see if I can address that, because what we have to recognize is that an offense against an eternally good being is an eternal offense. And we also have to recognize that in hell, it's not as if their offense and the rebellion ends. They, they will be cursing God forever in hell. So this, this, this offense is an eternal offense. But how is that honoring and glorifying to God? Which seems to be your question. Because hell is a sign of God's justice. And justice is an attribute of God. If we didn't have a court system that exercised justice, it would be a farce. Now I recognize this is intense, this is severe. But we, God has revealed to us that he is, and we have said, no, I, I, I want to be in charge. I don't want you to be in charge. It is something that he has revealed to us, and we have said no, and he exercises justice. And as much as the grace of God is glorious in terms of his grace, the justice of God is glorious to him in terms of his justice. All right. Hi. Oh, there's so many good questions. It's going to be hard to live up to that. My question is to Dr. Shermer. So um, you talked about how in the Bible, it really like was like, you said it's in our nature to be good to each other. But in history, a lot of places where there wasn't 
God and Christianity and stuff, like uh, after the French Revolution, Robespierre basically took over France by himself. And he made uh, basically religion illegal. And it was, ended in chaos. So to me, that doesn't seem like humans like to be good to each other because he did so much evil. So could you explain to me what you mean by humans are good to each other when things like that happened? Yeah, and yeah sure. That's a good question. Um, okay, so when I say it's in our nature, we have a dual nature. It's not, it's not super simple. I mean, we have, metaphorically speaking, uh, better angels than inner demons, the, the better angels of our nature that Abraham Lincoln referred to. Uh, there is a nice metaphor against countering our, our inner demons. Okay, so we know what happens when the rule of law is lifted, when the police go on strike, for example. Uh, you know, looting happens. So that the inner demons come out. We need rules and laws. We need customs and mores and morals and so on that are taught and imposed or else the inner demons come out. But given the fact that there are incentives and when the rules are there, good fences make good neighbors, people actually like being good. They want to be good. You know, most athletes don't want to dope. They do it because they think everybody else is doing it and it cascades into this kind of game theory thing of a evolutionary arms race. It's like that. Uh, people want to be good because it feels good to be good. But you know, if you think that you can get away with it and that other people are doing it anyway, it's easy for the system to break down, which is why we need uh, a, a society based on the rule of law. Even if it's a Christian society, because Christian societies also break down without a rule of law fairly quickly. So uh, the religion is something of an internal policeman at the beginning, and it's still there in part. Even if you think you got away with it because there was no cop at the intersection there, uh, there's an eye in the sky watching you. I, I don't mean the drones now, there's, there's that now, but you know, religion's eye in the sky, okay? Um, and, um, but, but one of the things that's been happening that's been driving the moral arc, bending the moral arc, is that we have, over the centuries, been internalizing a lot of the values uh, that we uh, embrace now as, as second nature. Uh, you know, the, the way people treated each other in the Middle Ages, you know, to, the instruments of torture, the way you know, the rates of violence, homicide, and so on uh, were astronomically higher than today. And, and it just never occurs to me to do certain things. I was uh, on this podcast a couple of days ago with this guy, Joe Rogan, and we got to talking about this, this very thing, and, he, and his producer pops up an interview with uh, Sean Connery uh, from 1987 with Barbara Walters where he's articulating when it's proper to slap a woman. Now, you don't just slap women, you know, willy-nilly. It's only, you know, when you've tried everything else and they still don't get it. And Barbara Walters is like, are you kidding me? I mean, you don't want to, are you sure this is what you mean? Yeah, you can watch it on YouTube, it's right there. All right, he, it, this is his generation. He's an old guy in 1987, all right? It's like Donald Sterling with the Clippers, an old guy. It never occurs to me to slap my wife when, you know, she doesn't behave properly. Okay? She's a German. And, and she's a German. She'll, <laughs> she'll kick my ass. Yeah. <laughs> well, there is that. <laughs> but one of, the, one of the things that we've been internalizing is just self-control. You know, just the technologies of self I'm going to count to 10. I'm going to leave the room. I'm going to, you know, before it escalates, I'm not going to, you know, let this happen. Now, this doesn't always happen. Uh, this is part of the problem with, you know, rates of violence going up, you know, the Ferguson effect. You know, the police don't want to get out of their cars now because everybody's got a cell phone camera. So they go to wherever the corner is and they got the call. They don't get out. And so the crime happens and, and, and so forth. So there, you know, people, the rule of law, we need it. We need the cops. Anyway, that's sort of a diversion. But uh, and let me mention, by the way, miracles. They still happen all the time, all over the place. It's just, you're not at the right church. If you go to a Pentecostal church, you'll see miracles going crazy. If you go to India and see Sai Baba and some of these other holy men, they're performing miracles. It looks like a Penn and Teller uh, magic show, uh, you know, and, and, or a Copperfield kind of thing, right? So there's people that claim that these things still happen. It's just that most... Christians have inculcated the Western scientific worldview going, okay, this is probably, you know, the miracles aren't really happening. Hello. Uh, my question is for Dr. Schumer. Um, so I guess my question is, um, 
you've dedicated a lot of time to learning about science and basically trying to prove that God doesn't exist. But how much time have you actually spent with the very evidence, the book, the Holy Bible, trying to prove that he does? Like, how much time have yeah. you spent in the Word? Uh, Twelve and a half minutes a day. No. Okay. Um. Uh, I, I get your question. Uh, well, so, so, uh, first of all, I'm not trying to disprove God. That's not my thing. You know, there are people that call themselves militant atheists or anti-theists or, or whatever. That's not my thing. I'm a pro-reason, pro-science, pro-liberty, pro-freedom guy. And, uh, and, you know, teach people how to think and let them get there on their own. We know, uh, for example, in any case, it doesn't work really to try to deconvert people from any particular belief. If you, you know, attack them, leave religion out, just say you have a climate skeptic or a creationist or a anti-vaxxer, you know, whatever the claim is, you know, you're on one side, they're on the other side. If, the moment you say, you know, I think you're an idiot for believing this, end of the conversation's over, right? So, you know, you can present the evidence, present the facts as best you can, be respectful, hopefully they'll change their mind, maybe they won't. So that's, I'm, I'm not an anti-God uh, person in that sense. Uh, it, it's more religion that worries me and, and not really Christianity. It's, you know, Islamism is the obvious concern right now. And that wasn't always the case. It was Marxism. It's the isms, the ideologies that drive people to commit violence. And that's what, that's what uh, I spend my time worried about, not, not God's existence or anything like that. I, but I do know the literature. I, I was a Christian, a born again Christian for seven, almost eight years. And so I've read the book many times. I know all the arguments. I've read the, you know, the evidence that demands a verdict and all those. And I know the Christian apologetics works. I've read them all, you know, and so I know the arguments. Um, I think there's a scripture, and I can't, you know, I can't cite it, but I feel like there's a scripture, something to the effect of God reveals himself to those who seek the truth sincerely. And um, so my question and, I guess, commentary for you would be, one, it seems as though a lot of the opposition you have to the, the existence of God is less to do with God's identity or whether God exists, but more to do with kind of your opposition or um, disagreement with the theology of Christianity, especially some of the values of mores, right? So I'm wondering, in the, if you were to be given definitive evidence of God, let's just say he just approached you one day and said, I exist, and you had no issues with his existence, and then you had no issues with the accuracy of the Bible, like it's authentic now, how then would you find yourself reconciling intellectually with the, the, um, the, 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 uh, the theology, gay marriage, you know, adultery, um, things, things that maybe, you know, you have a position on now outside of that scripture. How would you come to reconcile that if you were to be um, convinced that God existed in the Bible yeah, was accurate? probably the same way most Christians do now. I mean, most Christians, for example, are no longer uh, opposed to interracial marriage, although almost all were as late as 1967 when the Supreme Court finally overturned uh, the law that made it illegal for blacks and whites to marry, now almost everybody, I mean, almost nobody opposes it now. Pollsters don't even ask anymore. Uh, it's such an absurd question. What are you talking, what, why would you be opposed to interracial marriage? Who, who would think like that? Well, almost everybody did half a century ago in this Christian nation. So I would say, you know, it's, the arc is bending, the moral sphere is expanding to include more people that have more. The gay marriage thing, it's still a little bit of a thing. In the 2015, summer 2015, Supreme Court voted. Uh, it'll go, there'll be a little upburst here and there for about five years, and then in 10 years, no one will ever, even be talking about it. Everyone in this room will go, yeah, gays, whatever, dude, I don't care. Uh, do whatever you want. You wanna get married, you're in love, fine. That's what everybody will think, and we'll go, what were they thinking back in 2010? I mean, Obama, 2011. I'm against gay marriage. You know, that was 28, 2011. He said, I'm for it now. Okay, so everybody's changing. That's how it goes. Um, this is loud. <laughs> Dr. Shermer, thank you for putting yourself in front of a room full of people that disagree with you and knowing you are probably going to get most <laughs> oh, of the y questions. Seem so <laughs> <laughs> um, in your opening statement, you said that atheism is not a worldview. You said, Atheism is, atheism is nothing. And I think, I can't read your mind, but I think you're thinking in terms of the scientific method, and the scientific method is based on doubt. 
So you say something's not true until you prove it is, and that's basically the scientific method. Yeah. And so it seems to me that's kind of where you're coming from on saying atheism, atheism is nothing. We're starting from nothing, and so nothing's been proved to us, so we're yeah. not moving off yeah. our, you right. know, where we're that's standing. Right. Yeah. Um, but I'd just like to ask you, is it not true that the scientific method itself requires a framework of assumptions, so you can't truly start from nothing. And also, can you live your life by believing only in that which has been proven? And what about people that haven't seen the, or you know, examined the proof for things? How do they live their lives? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, again, first of all, most atheists, I mean, there's surveys on this now, most of them are politically liberal, for example, although there's a smaller branch of conservatives and a larger group of uh, libertarians. Uh, and, and they're all over the place on, you know, on different specific issues, gun control, things like that. So this is what I mean when I say it isn't a thing, because usually when we have an ism of some kind, there's a sort of set of tenets about, well, where do you stand on abortion, gun control, foreign uh, invasions, you know, things like this, right? So there, when the atheist is giving his opinion, it's really not as an atheist. It's really as a humanist or a Democrat or whatever, whatever they affiliate with in terms of a worldview associated with that particular issue. So, up second, the, yes, of course, in science, we start with the null hypothesis. Uh, you know, I think I have this drug uh, that cures AIDS. It's uh, the milk from an arthritic goat. And this is a real story. Uh, you may have seen uh, Charlie Sheen uh, gave up his uh, AIDS cocktail and uh, went to Mexico and tried this uh, drug out. And uh, Bill Maher featured this quack doctor on his show. Four million people saw this. So, of course, we were inundated with questions about this because one of our things is studying alternative, so-called alternative medicine. There is no such thing as alternative medicine. There's just medicine that's been tested and everything else. And so everything else is just null. We, we just assume it doesn't work unless it's been proven otherwise. Milk from a goat with arthritis doesn't work. So Charlie went, you know, doc, he went on Dr. Oz and Dr. Oz did the little intervention and he's back on the drug cocktail. He's you know, back to non-detectable levels of HIV and so forth. Okay, so that, to so take religion out of it, just any, any claim. Uh, so, okay, so, but then finally you're, deeper question, sort of the epistemological question, why, why trust science at all? Because it works. You know, ultimately, I can't use science to prove science is, you know, the, the, the only way to know or, or, or whatever. It doesn't matter. You want to get a spacecraft to Mars, you use physics, astrophysics, astronomy, and so forth, not astrology. It doesn't work. Astronomy, not astrology, and so on. Same, th same thing with all these medical claims, the germ theory of disease, whatever. It works. That's why we use it to the extent that we can, anywhere we can. Um, hi, I have a question for Pastor Paul. Finally, <laughs> I was getting lonely up here. <laughs> what are your specific beliefs on the creation of humankind and evolution in general? Yeah, I'm, I'm not an evolutionist in the Darwinian sense. I believe in a, a, a microevolution. I believe there are variations within the species. Things change, you know. Um, in terms of creation, um, you know, Dr. Schumer always asks, you know, how, how did you know, you believe in the creation, you know, God created everything, how did she do it? He likes to say. Um, <laughs> the answer to that, I mean, it, it's, it's not an unreasonable answer. It is, but it's not gonna be a satisfactory answer for people who just choose not to accept it. God spoke us into being, bara. He spoke us into being. God's, God said and it was. And so our existence here is a result of God speaking us into being. Uh, this question is directed to uh, Dr. Shermer. Um, you've mentioned several times tonight that um, it goes back to how do you know? How do you know? How do you know? And I agree. I think it always comes back to epistemology. How do we know what we know? And if we're going to talk about human knowledge, you have to have humans. And you've said that everything depends on evidence. If we're going to know something, there has to be evidence for it very uh, em empirical epistemology. So my question is, uh, you, you clearly believe in evolution, um, and that proposition is that non-life produces life. And your epistemology hangs on that, because if that's false, then your epistemology crumbles, because there's no human life. 
therefore there's no human knowledge. And yet you're, you're begging us to only believe in evidence, but there's zero evidence for non-life producing life. In fact, every single day, that proposition gets refuted. Life always begets life. So how do you reconcile, how do you reconcile that with human experience? Right, okay, so for the first part, uh, of course there are examples I gave, like I like dark chocolate versus milk chocolate. We don't need evidence for propositions. These are just internal preferences and subjective states. I know people that meditate like crazy and they say it works for them for all kinds of things. I, I don't know, I can't get inside their head. So th those are subjective internal states. So we're really talking about external objective propositions that we all wanna know, is it true or not? Uh, Dinosaurs, what, 65 million years ago? Maybe it was 63 million. You know, maybe it was 10,000 years ago. How do we know? Okay, well, here's our evidence. Okay, so really, what you're getting at, you're sort of pushing it back. You can certainly see how life gives rise to life. We just march all the way back, and if you want to believe that, uh, you know, God guided evolution, which is about 40% of Americans, God directed the evolutionary. They accept evolution entirely. I think God directed it in the same way that God creates solar systems by using the laws of gravity, God created the laws of nature that created solar systems, so the solar system. So you can accept all of astronomy and astrophysics and still believe in God in that model, and lots of people do. So all we're really doing is going, just pushing it back a little further. Well, how did the first cells come from? Well, we know that, you know, there's these pre pre-cellular, okay, where did those come from? You know, where did the, okay, the DNA came from RNA, all right? Where'd the RNA come from? Well, this is a pre-RNA replicating molecule. Okay, where did they come from? All right. So at some point, you're gonna transition like a virus. A virus is not quite alive in the same sense that other uh, organisms close to that in size, slightly larger, are alive. And a virus is a nice example of something that's not quite totally inert, uh, and it's not really alive. And so something like that, and, and when you say zero evidence, that's not true. There's actually uh, uh, lots of scientists and labs that work on this very problem, the origins of life problem. Uh, there's not consensus on how it started here, but there's about a dozen different theories. You can take one of these teaching company great courses on the origins of life. Uh, Robert Hazen is the uh, instructor. He's a, this is what he does for a living. And he will outline, here's the 12 theories. Which one is right? Nobody knows. But that's how science works. You know, that's what graduate students are for. Here, you go figure this out. <laughs> you go test this one. <laughs> you want to get your degree. You know, that, in other words, these are gaps that are filled by, by new knowledge. Instead of filling them with, well, that's where God did his magic thing. Well, okay, it, even if that was the case, we'd still want to know from a scientist's perspective, how did God do it? You know, did God reach into our world from beyond space and time or wherever God is and stir the particles in a way that caused the molecules to begin self-replicating? How did he go from, you know, chemistry to biochemistry, from inorganic to organic? How did God do that? And if you say, well, he used these forces of electromagnetism or whatever to bring the particles together, well, that's a natural explanation. If you say, well, a miracle happened, that's not really an answer. It doesn't, it, there's nothing to do with that. You can't take that in the lab and go, well, let's see if that actually is the right one. Maybe it's not that one, maybe it's this answer. Dr. Michael Shermer, Pastor Paul Vigiano, thank you very much for your debating tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give a big hand to our presenters. Thank you very much for coming, ladies and gentlemen. Good night.